And number 10, we have the Sintamani Stone. This is like a genie lamp, but way better. There are no limits to the amount of wishes you can pull out of this thing. The Sintamani Stone is said to be an artifact of great power that will grant wishes to the person who holds it. The original owner and wielder of this power was the Buddha, which in a way is a perfect match because you know he's not going to do anything evil with it, but it also seems like kind of a waste. Like a dude who has no need for material possessions has the power to wish for anything? Like, what are you going to ask for, dude? The stone has been depicted through many Southeast Asian cultures, like Hinduism, and some people think that the stone could be the equivalent to the Philosopher's Stone, the giving the owner health and potentially immortal life. Now I understand why Indiana Jones is always digging around for these things. This sounds like it would be a pretty good time. At number nine, we have Ark of the Covenant, a big old box that has some of the most sacred religious texts hidden inside them. This is considered one of the biggest lost artifacts in human history. The Ark of the Covenant is supposed to hold the original tablets of the Ten Commandments. The Word of God is chiseled into the stone about how you should live your life, and there's some pretty good rules on them. Like don't covet your neighbor's ox? Dude, if it wasn't for those tablets, I would be stealing oxes left, right, and center. I would be known as the North American ox thief, and I would have a stockpile of oxes that would take the world by storm. But thanks to the Babylonians conquering Jerusalem, the Ark was lost, and we have no idea where those texts are now. What would happen if we found them? Well, if we continue to follow the Indiana Jones rules, it would be something like this. Heads just exploding all over the place. At number eight, we have the seven league boots. If you really went digging around in these old artifacts, you could pull up some pretty cool stuff and become a superhero that has all these trinkets all over them. You would look stylish and you could save the day, and that's the best way to do it. Looking good while you're saving the day. Oh my god, great. The Seven League Boots would be such a hot look that Nike would come up with their own version. The Seven League Boots are supposed to give the person wearing them the ability to travel seven leagues in a single step. That's good, but nobody knows how long seven leagues is. Are you kidding me? I am actually just kidding you guys. It's like five kilometers. This is a very good power. You could travel on such a small budget. You wouldn't have to worry about buying plane tickets. You could just run as far as you want and end up in a new country and then maybe like put something in the bottom so you could step on water so you could like run across the ocean and go to Europe. That would be great. Or come over here, however you want to do it. At number seven, we have the Staff of the Monkey King. If you have never read the book Journey to the West, then you need to get on that now. It is the foundation of most modern storytelling. Dragon Ball took so much from this book that's hard not to see the direct comparison. The book takes from ancient Chinese tales and one of the main characters is the Monkey King. He has a magical staff that has the ability to stretch great distance or even shrink down to the size of a pin. That's a great weapon for whooping someone from a distance. It could stretch out and slap them in the face and then shrink down and be like, hey, I don't even, that wasn't even me. I didn't even do anything. I don't know what you're talking about. At number six, we have the Helm of Invisibility. Greek mythology has a ton of magical artifacts that have been lost to man. Maybe some of them never existed, or maybe some of them were destroyed, or maybe some of them are in a giant vault underneath the White House and every president gets to just have fun with them and put them on. That would be so unfair. Well, the Helm of Invisibility is is one of the main weapons in the arsenal of the great hero Perseus. He was the dude sent on one of the original fetch quests. One of the items he needed was the head of the Gorgon Queen Medusa. But anyone who looks at her gets turned to stone. So Perseus put on the Helm of Invisibility so he could get close enough to her to cut her head off and guess what? It worked. So this thing doesn't only let you turn invisible, but it also withstands the horrible gaze of a bloodthirsty Gorgon. This is a two for one. Number five, we have Excalibur. The sword and the stone that is one of the most powerful weapons known to man. Well, and it's time when people we're writing about this magical weapon like, like this is before nukes like I, I don't know if the sword can beat a nuke I don't know but it said that the person who has this sword is the true king of England and part of the royal bloodline in some depictions, the sword has some sort of magical powers. There have been all sorts of powers attached to this blade, but some of the more popular abilities is the ability to cut through any stone in a single swipe. The power to kill anything, and I mean anything, like it could be a magical creature, supernatural creature, cosmic, you could kill anything with the sword. In theory, the blade could cut through Cthulhu. That's pretty nuts. But one of the most important abilities is the person wielding the sword can recover from any wounds. We are building a very powerful arsenal of magical weapons on this list. And number four, we have the Club of Dagda. This is the weapon of a god that could bring almost any change he wanted. Dagda is a Celtic god and he was the representation of male strength and he had control of almost every aspect of life. He could kill anything he wanted and then bring it back to life. He could control time, weather, and even bring great famine or plentiful harvest. This dude would give Thor a run for his money. A fight between these two would be a pay per view I would definitely pay for. I wouldn't just steal from a streaming site, like I'd actually give them my money. This club is said to be the item that holds the key to life and death. With the blunt and sending people to the grave, but then the handle being able to resurrect them. At number three, we have the Cup of Jamshid. 
Pulled from Persian mythology, it's said that the potion that lays inside this cup brings the person who drinks it immortality. Some people believe that the most successful conquests of the Persian Empire came from someone who had this cup in their possession in secret. And the cup wouldn't only give you the ability to live forever, but also anyone who looked into it would see through all space. You could see all over the world and through the seven heavens. You would get true sight and you could also live forever. You would become the smartest person who has ever lived. At number two, we have the Book of Thoth. The ancient Egyptians had a rich mythology that we don't often see represented in film and television, but throughout it there were some godly weapons. The Book of Thoth was written by the god of knowledge himself. He gave the book to humanity in a way to enrich their lives. It would teach the reader how to communicate with anything. They would be able to talk to animals, insects, humans, and even the gods themselves. But it is a human way to misuse things, so Thoth put a curse on the book. Prince Neferkaptha was in possession of the book, but it cursed him and all of his closest family members to die. Later, he was buried with this treasure. At number one, we have the Spear of Destiny. Now, one of the most powerful weapons in the Bible, and if the stories are true, it would make sense that this thing is supercharged with godly abilities. The Spear of Destiny is said to be the spear that sent Jesus to the grave. If you kill the Son of God, there are going to be some ripple effects. Some of Jesus' godly power leaked onto the spear. This supercharged it, and it gave the person holding it the ability to move the world in any direction they see fit. There are rumors throughout history that great rulers were in possession of this spear. Some say Genghis Khan had it in his conquest and that's how he was able to take over so much of the world. Other people believe that Hitler found the spear right before he launched his attacks on Europe. The idea of Hitler having the spear does hold a little bit of water because he was someone who was very interested in magical artifacts. He would send out task force in search of some of the world's lost mythical items to give him power and maybe it was the spear that gave him guidance to take over a lot of Europe. Coming in at number 10 we have the Antikythera Mechanism. Mapping out the stars is something that many civilizations have done throughout history. I mean, it's pretty hard not to be blown away by what is floating around above you in this massive net of lights and endless void of blackness, but it was more than this. The stars could be used to map out directions so you could know where you're going in the dead of night when the sun wasn't being kind enough to show you which direction you needed to head in. The Antikythera mechanism was maybe the most advanced form of mapping out the stars we have ever seen from ancient civilizations. There's a series of gears and systems almost like a massive clock. It has two signs that were most likely used for mapping out different things. But the wild thing about this archaeological find is that to this day we don't know exactly what it was used for. The thing is just too complex. I wonder what type of thing that we have today that no one will be able to find out what it was used for in the future. Is it going to be Heelys or something? Like why did they want wheels on their shoes? Was it for speed? Was it for fashion? Turns out it's for both baby. Gotta go fast. Gotta look good. If that isn't a slogan already, it should be. Coming in at number nine, we have the Piri's Res map. I think one of the coolest and worst jobs you could have had back in the day would have been an explorer. I mean, you could go and find a new land and literally become famous because of your discoveries. You could get knighted and everyone in the world would want to hear his stories about traveling across the globe to see some of the most exotic things the world has to offer. But at the same time, you would have to spend months at a time on a boat with only dudes. And then you might end up in a place that is so insanely cold, you lose some of your fingers and toes. Or you could be in a jungly area that has a tiger that is trying to kill you and you have literally never seen a tiger before in your life. But for Piri Rez, things seemed to work out all right. The dude was from Hungary and it seemed that he had such a great understanding of the world that people thought he could have come from the future. The dude had a map that broke down the location of Antarctica 200 years before it was officially discovered and disclosed to the world. This means that this man had a better understanding of the world than anyone around him. There's also the fact that he mapped out missing continents that have disappeared. I would love a new continent. I really just want a new culture of people so I can try a new food that I didn't even know existed. It's the main reason I want aliens to be real so they can come here and give me food. Coming in at number eight, we have the Hindu bell. Answer this question. How did an old brass bell that looks like it has some carvings in it that look like a Hindu god end up in a mine in West Virginia encased in a lump of coal that was 300 million years old? Huh? How? You tell me how. I don't know. I don't know how. Was it because the future people came back to leave a bell for some other people? Did some people cross the Atlantic way before we think? Or was the whole thing a hoax? Well, I don't know, dude. Let me know in the comments what you think. Coming in at number seven, we have the Dendera lights. There might have been light bulbs that were discovered in ancient Egypt. Yeah, everyone likes to jump on the bad wagon of Thomas Edison when we talk about the person who brought light to homes. But he really was just a con man who had an eye for a good patent and killed a 
prisoner in one of the most brutal executions ever because his ego was too big to let Nikola Tesla have the better version of technology. But when we start to flow back through time, we find that the Egyptians used to worship something called the Dendera Lights. It would seem that hieroglyphs in the Hafar temple would show that the Egyptians used to be able to harness the power of glowing lights and they might have used it to party. How could they have done something like this? Well, no one knows and the markings might have just been art, but it could have been tech that was brought to them from the future. Might have been alien tech since ancient Egyptians are always associated with aliens. Coming in at number six, we have the underwater pyramid. There has been so much footage of strange things flying around in the air that it shocks me that we haven't been introduced to even one alien yet. Honestly, I hope that it happens in my lifetime because this pandemic has just been such a drag. We need something to spice things up, but maybe we haven't been able to run into any space dudes because they have all been underwater. There are some people who think that all the aliens who come to visit come to a secret underwater base, and that's why we don't see them. And this pyramid that was found in Yonaguni, Japan might be hints to this. Now, at first glance, the people who came to look at it said that it's just a normal rock formation, nothing special about it. But then some people said that they found a massive knife down there. And then some other people said that knife was a fake and had nothing to do with a massive underwater pyramid. Then some people stated that there was art carved into the side of this pyramid, which hasn't been disproven yet. Okay, but it still could be. There are theories floating around that this could be connected to Atlantis or that it could be a hotspot for alien visitors who brought some tech from the future to make a home base just outside of Japan. Coming in at number five, we have the Nazca Lines. Oh, don't think that we're off the idea of aliens coming to Earth just yet. I mean, we're doing a list of artifacts from the future. There's going to be a lot of alien talk on this one. The Nazca Lines might be one of the oldest and strangest discoveries in the area. They went unnoticed for thousands of years until the 1930s. This is mainly because you can only see them from the sky. They are massive lines that are seen running through the ground. They are made in a pretty primitive way by just moving the Earth, which is traditionally red, to showcase the white earth underneath. Now that doesn't seem like it came from the future at all. Well, this is where the future thing comes in. These lines were made over 2,000 years ago, and the question is, why did they make them? Some people think that this could have been a way to communicate with aliens or beings from the future. Other people think that this could have just been rituals to send a message to a god in order to have a good year of crops. Mind you, those gods might have been aliens from the future. Next on the list, we have the Archilochori Axe. I mean, this is really just an axe. What so special about it. I could go buy an axe right now and it would do the same thing that it did thousands of years ago. It would chop. Well, unless you have a TikTok that's dedicated to chopping wood, then the axe is used to chop wood and rev a woman's libido. But what has put this axe on this list is the fact that it was made over 4,000 years ago and it has a ton of strange markings in it all over it and no one has been able to decipher them. There are 15 different symbols on it, which is very strange for this kind of tool. It would have just been used to chop wood. Why did someone put so much work into making it look nice? There's also the fact that the axe is very advanced for its era. Maybe the person who made it had knowledge from the future, or maybe they were just the best axe maker of their time and decided to deck out their axe with a bunch of cool drawings. Like, you know, if you're making a table for yourself today, you're gonna make the thing custom and cool as hell. Next, we have the Lunar Tacked Disc. How did the Vikings become one of the most dominant warriors of their time? Was it weaponry? Was it the lack of empathy? Was it the way they would dress? Well, it might have been all of those things combined with the lunar tack disc. This thing was basically the most advanced compass of its day. The thing could tell the Vikings how to cross vast oceans, which was a key part in how they were able to be such a dominant force. They would be able to venture away far away from their homes and then pull up on some people and just start hacking and slashing. They could cut everyone's head off and really go to town on the whole area. They would take some prisoners, they would burn things to the ground. You didn't want to be on the receiving end of a Viking axe. But the way they were able to make these long ocean voyages without the fear of getting lost was through the lunar tack disc. This thing was the most advanced compass of its day and it could even work at night. This thing was able to somehow cast light onto the compass that would be similar to using a sundial during the day. Apparently it used magic crystals. These crystals might have come from the future. We have no idea really how they worked because we've never found one. Next on the list, we have the Baghdad battery. When was the first battery ever made? 
made? When did we figure out how to lock down the power of electricity and put it into a little area so that it could be used for Xbox controllers? Do those things still take batteries or do they have rechargeable batteries now? For how long have we been seeing people control the power of lightning in a Duracell? Well, it turns out that we might have been able to do this for longer than you think. The Baghdad battery was discovered back in 1938 and trust me, it was turning some heads. It had a copper rod inside of it and what some people are saying is electroplating. If this is true, that means that people back then were able to harness some juice into a clay pot. If this is possible, that means I could set up some clay pots in my home and charge my phone like that. I could get off the grid with a little bit of clay and copper. I like the sound of that. All right, next on the list, guys, we have the London Hammer. Okay, this is for sure the craziest one. Mind you, I know nothing about geology, so this might be normal, but the internet seems to think that this is a big deal, and who am I to deny them? The London Hammer seems to be a regular relic, some old hammer that a blacksmith probably used to make some tools and weapons. I mean, there is really nothing cool about that, and it definitely didn't come from the future, but then you find out that the hammer was found in some limestone that is 400 million years old. What does that mean? I don't really know. Does limestone that old just hang around and anything can get stuck in it? Or is it something that can only happen if the hammer got launched into it at the time? I have no clue, man, but some people seem to think that something spectacular happened here because people are constantly talking about how this is completely unexplained. Coming in number 10, we have flexible glass. I mean, think of what we could do with a substance like that. You could make windows that never break. You could make a cup that never breaks. You make a bunch of other things that could never break. Basically, it would be an extremely durable version of everyday glass, and you could bet that would be a hot selling item. The first record of flexible glass happened between the years 14 and 37 AD. There was the great emperor Tiberius who would take exotic goods from all over the land. There was a glass maker who came to him with something very unique. It was a beautiful vase. He handed it to the emperor who dropped it by accident, but the vase didn't break. It dented. The glass maker quickly repaired it in front of the emperor as a way to impress him, but it didn't work like that. The emperor saw this as a threat, for his empire had a ton of wealth in precious metals to make various items. This flexible glass could have hurt business, so to hide the secret of this glass maker, he had him taken to the dungeon and killed. Not how this dude probably thought this was going to play out. And if you comb through history, there were a couple more times where this mistake mysterious material pops up, but it never has made its way to this day and age. Who knows? Maybe someone will make this material and be able to keep their head on their shoulders. And guys, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. It really helps us out. Coming in number nine, we have the Hufanj Di Dong Yi. How do you know when an earthquake has happened? Well, you need a bunch of high-tech gear to tell you when it hit and how powerful it was. Well, that is actually dead wrong. There was a device in ancient China that was made by Zhang Hong. He was was an incredible genius for his time and created a seismograph that was incredibly accurate. This thing was basically a big pot that would move with the shifting earth. There was a pendulum inside it that could point you in the direction of where an earthquake had just hit. And this device had an incredible range and could reach up to a hundred miles away. The benefit of this was an emperor could find out what villages needed help because they were just hit by a natural disaster well before they sent an envoy to come receive help. How could you make something like that was just some pot and levers. I mean, if I was alive back then, I probably would have thought earthquakes happened because you didn't give enough grain to the river god. Coming in at number eight, we have a heat ray. I mean, we have all wanted ray guns since we were kids. When will we finally get some cool futuristic weapons that can blow our minds? Well, you might want to look into the past to find something like that. The ancient Greeks had a way to blast heat at enemy ships and set them ablaze. They would have massive bronze plates that would reach direct the sun's rays back at enemy ships that were approaching through the water. This would focus it like a magnifying glass and burn these ships like a weird kid who's killing ants. So the ancient Greeks had a heat ray before we had a heat ray now? That is really starting to bother me right now. Coming in number seven, we have the pyramids. I mean, this one was a given. You can't make a list of amazing ancient relics without throwing the pyramids on that list because we still don't know what happened. How did they build these big ass triangles? 
temples. They are over 4,000 years old. They are 147 meters high. They have a ton of rooms and secret chambers and booby traps and detailed markings all over the walls. The Egyptians didn't have access to modern metals or even wheels. There's an estimated 2 million stones in a single pyramid. The stones weigh somewhere between one and a half and three tons. How on earth did they do it? Some people say aliens, which I don't believe. I mean, it could have been some space dudes, but I would hope that they would give us something a little bit better than rock towers. I mean, give us a ray gun or something, that's what I want. But some people think that the Egyptians could have had access to some sort of tech that was far advanced for their time, but they either destroyed it because they didn't want anyone else to use it, or the tech was simply lost to time. Coming in at number six, we have the Unartok disc. Have you ever tried to use a GPS other than Google Maps or Waze? They will take you all over the place and have you parked in some field that's six miles away from your destination. Maybe not that bad, but the Vikings had a device that put some of these apps to shame. The Unartok disc was a sundial type compass that could be used to navigate through the seas with an accuracy that was as good as a modern day compass. This explains how the Vikings were able to travel such great distances and always make it back to their homeland. But when you're making these long trips, eventually the sun will go down and then everyone is going to be praying that you don't get thrown off course while the sun isn't up. But the Vikings found a way to get this bad boy to work even when there was no light. How do you get a sundial to work in the dark? Well, you have magic crystals. That's how the ancient texts describe them. Did these Vikings have help from the gods? Well, probably not. What these crystals could most likely do was project light onto this compass when there was only a very small light source. So with the moon and the stars, you would be able to navigate in Jord's seas. Coming in at number five, we have the boomerang. All right, guys, now it's time to head down under for one of the oldest, most advanced hunting tools that we have ever seen. Sure, we have things that can kill things more effectively now than a boomerang does, but we have to appreciate how precise and deadly these things were and how you can find some ancient relics of boomerangs that seem to be better built than the ones we have today. And in case you didn't know, boomerangs are basically a wing. Someone invented something that could fly around 2300 years ago. Well, that is the oldest boomerang ever found, so the first one could have been even older than that. Before people had shoes, someone made something that could not only fly and kill something, but it would also return to them. I don't know who that guy was, but whoever he was, he was an absolute legend. That guy for sure chucked that thing for the first time, and the whole tribe was like, dude, you are going to be king forever because that is the coolest thing that I have ever seen in my life. I literally don't know how the sun works, and you just made a flying stick that comes back to you like a dog fetching a ball. This is amazing. Coming in at number four, we have Greek fire. This is one of the biggest mysteries of ancient Greek warfare. See, the Greeks had a weapon like none other. It was fired out of a long metallic tube that was attached to boats. It was some sort of napalm-like substance that they would fire out of these tubes and it would lace enemy ships in a flaming substance that couldn't be put out by simply pouring water on it. It must have looked like a dragon breathing fire on you. The secret as to how they were able to make such a weapon never leaked out into the wrong hands. So to this day, we still have no idea how they were able to do it. Maybe some future dudes came back in time and was like, hey, you guys wanna see something that's really gonna blow your mind? Well, let me show you this wild thing right here real quick. If you were an enemy getting blasted by this stuff, you would have for sure thought it was magic. Coming in at number three, we have ancient Chinese wells. You know how we're burning through a ton of fossil fuels right now? And after saying that, I literally understand why they call them fossil fuels because it's fuel that comes from fossils. God, I am dumb sometimes. Well, we all know that there are much cleaner forms of energy that we should probably be using because the world seems like it's gonna die if we don't change up our tactics. Well, in ancient China, they had tapped into wells that were full of natural gas. They dug wells deep into the ground and this was originally so they could harvest salt in land because it was very hard to get salt without going down to the ocean unless you dug these massive wells. But with this, they found shots of methane. They then built bamboo tubes that led to people's homes so they could use the natural gas to heat their houses. That's pretty cool if you ask me, but now that I'm thinking about it, methane isn't the cleanest energy, but it's still amazing tech to have a natural gas chute that goes directly to your home. Coming in number two, we have the Ulfbirth sword. There was a tomb found in Scandinavia that had some amazing swords in it. There were over a hundred swords discovered and there was something that set these bladed weapons apart from all the others from the era. They were much more advanced than any other swords that were made from nations around that time. These blades were made out of 99.9% .9 pure metal. I mean, if you were to look into most metal objects today, I'm sure they would be skimping somewhere. The metal pieces 
pieces in your car probably have little bits of plastic in them to help cut cost. What was so impressive about these weapons is that the surrounding areas would not get this kind of technology until 800 years later. Between the compass that you could use in the dark when you were out on the ocean and the swords that were 800 years ahead of their time, it's no wonder that the Vikings were able to be such a force of destruction. And coming at the number one spot, we have Mithridatium. That sounds like something that would be pulled out of a Tolkien book, but it's actually one of the most mysterious substances made by King Mithridates IV of Pontius. This guy was living during Emperor Nero's reign around 60 BC. The king had developed a substance called Mithridatium, which was apparently an antidote to all poisons. Sounds like a pretty handy tool, especially if you're a king or emperor. We all know that people are trying to poison them at all hours of the day. Now, the recipe for this substance was never let out to the public. Only the king and Emperor Nero himself knew how to make it, and maybe they should have told a few more people because eventually the formula was lost, and since then, no one has been able to recreate this elixir. But maybe it was all a lie. Nero could have spread rumors that he had such a tool so people wouldn't be so bold to poison him. I mean, that would be a pretty smart move.